Hi there. How are we? So this is the 20th Symposium on Indigenous Music and Dance, and I am Aaron Korn from the National Recording Project for Indigenous Performance in Australia and the University of Melbourne. I want to thank Auntie Lola Ryan for her brilliant welcome to country uh, earlier during the opening session of the 44th Annual Conference of the Musicological Society of Australia and the 20th Symposium on Indigenous Music and Dance. And in this session, we open the first panel of the 20th Symposium on Indigenous Music and Dance, hosted by the National Recording Project for Indigenous Performance in Australia. Uh, before I begin, I want to acknowledge country. Um, I myself am sitting on Woi Wurrung Wurundjeri country in Melbourne, in the northern suburbs. And I want to acknowledge the countries of all the places where all of our delegates and uh, audience members are sitting and watching these sessions from today. And to welcome all ind Indigenous delegates and audience members we have out there and indeed everybody else. I want to thank the convener of the um, 44th Annual Conference of the Musicological Society of Australia, Michael Hooper at the University of New South Wales for partnering with us in hosting this event and also the national executive members um, other than Michael and myself and the national committee members of the Musicological Society of Australia for their ongoing support of everything that we do. So welcome everybody and thank you for being here. We have a brilliant symposium lined up for the 20th. It's a bumper edition packed with three days of extraordinarily um, thrilling content. The 20th symposium, however, would never have come to fruition, of course, without a first symposium. And even though it's not quite our 20th anniversary, that, that will happen next year because of the way the calendars work, but uh, it is our 20th symposium, which is still a big number. And for that reason, I want to especially thank at this point, um, Alan Marrett, Marcia Langton, the late great Mandawa Yunapingu, and IATSIS, the Australian Institute for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies, for pulling together the very first symposium on Indigenous music and dance at the Gama Festival, at the Yiringa Studio at Gunyangara, back in 2002. So thank you for all the foundations that you have laid to ensure that we can be here meeting this week. We've had many great symposia, of course, since then with many people who are speaking today and over the next few days who have um, run those events and helped. There are actually too many people really to name in the one point right now. But last year's um, symposium at the Willen Centre at the University of Melbourne, led by Cherokee Onis and Sally Treloyne, was of course a great highlight um, um, amongst a very, very difficult year of lockdowns in Melbourne and other parts of Australia due to COVID. Next year, we have some very exciting plans for what the symposium can look like, and we'll share them with you at the end of our meeting on Saturday. So this program for the 20th Symposium on Indigenous Music and Dance runs in three parts uh, with three different partners contributing uh, programming and resources to it. The first session this morning, which is going to be chaired by Samuel Kirkpatrick at the University of Divinity, where he is now a postdoctoral fellow, will focus on music and spirituality. And that is actually the final session of a two day symposium that um, Sam has been running that started yesterday and we thought it would be a great way to celebrate Central for Future Links around discussions about music and spirituality to have his final session be our opening session. Uh, there I would like to thank the VC of the University of Divinity, Peter Sherlock, for hosting us yesterday and contributing resources and interest to today. And also to thank uh, Nungalin New College in Darwin for providing speaker support uh, for people who couldn't make the journey to Melbourne or anywhere else. 
core national recording project for Indigenous Performance Australia sessions and programming will kick off after lunch this afternoon and run all the way through to the first session on Sunday, on Saturday morning. The person who brought those sessions together from a coordination perspective was largely Sally Treloyne. So I want to thank her for her efforts in doing that. I also want to thank the two convening chairs of panels who brought entire fully formed ideas for panels to us. And they are Alan Marrett this afternoon and who has, who has, who has one panel that he's chairing that runs till close today. And Ruben Brown, who uh, put together not only one panel, but two that will run tomorrow. So thank you very much for everything that you're contributing to our programming uh, over the next few days. I also want to thank Pay Linda Ford and Clint Bracknell for agreeing to participate in adjudicating the Postgraduate Student Prize that the Musicological Society of Australia offers for student presenters in those core National Recording Project sessions and to John A. Phillips for coordinating the prize process overall. Uh, Clint, Pay, and I are working across three time zones to do this. And I also have to be um, in ghost mode in the background a lot of the time running things operationally myself. So all of the student presentations will be recorded uh, purely for adjudication processes so that we can review them and compare. Finally, the final sessions on Saturday that start after morning tea will be the first intersection symposium of the Indigenous Knowledge Institute at the University of Melbourne, which of course I direct. Um, I really want to thank my team at the Indigenous Knowledge Institute or the IKI for short, because they have tirely, tirelessly worked um, not only to put together that part of the program, but also to work across the whole program to help pull it together. Uh, there are many people who have helped put this together and I'm hoping that I'm getting to thanking you all because I know, I know that everybody who's here now won't probably be here Saturday afternoon to hear this. So I want to thank my manager, Kirsten Clark. I want to thank um, my producer and project officer, Brittany Carter, who's both of whom are just extraordinary. Um, our director of research capability, Michael Sean Fletcher and my research associate, Anthea Skinner, who very cleverly has just been awarded a McKinsey Fellowship. So she can commence a postdoctoral fellowship in the VCA at the University of Melbourne. Congratulations. I also want to thank the leadership of the University of Melbourne for its um, support for the IKI. Um, there are many people who support us in the university, which is brilliant, but in particular, our vice chancellor, Duncan Maskell, and Associate Provost Marcia Langton. Finally, for that final day, I should thank Anangoku Arts, known as Ku Arts for short, in Adelaide for providing speaker support on that Saturday. And finally, uh, to our partners at Stage, who are helping us shape the look of sessions as we go through the days. I will be listening to as many presentations as I possibly can. Uh, often in the background as I'm doing operational things to keep the program moving along. And I'll apologize in advance if I seem to be absent over Zoom uh, while attending those sessions, uh, but I'm not, I am there, but sometimes I won't be able to respond because I'm running things in the background. And sometimes I won't be on my personal link, I'll be on some kind of production Zoom link. But, Thank you all for being here. I hope you have a great few days ahead. Our speakers are as brilliant as they have ever been. Um, maybe more so, I don't know. We'll see how we go, but there are many of them. We're speaking from all parts of the country. I think probably the furthest place from me where people are speaking from other than overseas speakers, which we do have on Saturday, I think. Uh, within Australia would probably be in the Kimberley. 
uh, but we have people in Darwin, we have people in Arnhem Land, we have people like Wanta at Lajamanu, we have people in Adelaide, we have people from a lot of different places. And of course, you know, people like Flynn and Perth as well. So thank you very, very much for being here. Um, I really look forward to hopefully being able to see people and talk to you over the next few days. And now to chair the first session of the 20th Symposium on Indigenous Music and Dance, I'm going to hand over to Samuel Kirkpatrick. Thank you. Thanks very much, Aaron. And, and I have to say uh, congratulations on your efforts over the past 20 years. An amazing amount of work that you've put into forming uh, this network and, and some wonderful events that uh, personally, at least over the last 10 years, I've, I've gained a lot from. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm also here on the lands of the Wiradjuri Woi Wurrung people. Um, and I hope that our understanding and connections continue to grow into the future as we learn to sit and listen and work together. Thanks also uh, to the University of Divinity and their partnership with the Indigenous Knowledge Institute at the University of Melbourne for supporting the past uh, day and, and today's um, engagements that we've had. Uh, it's been wonderful to have uh, figures like Juan Jumba Jumba Patrick, who many of you know through his work and, and ceremony and, and various uh, um, advocacy and um, a consultancy to government bodies. But many of you may not know that Wanta is a, um, a highly sought after um, teacher of Indigenous Christian leaders across the country. And so it was wonderful to gather uh, many leaders from right across Australia uh, involved, in, um, involved in Christian and spiritual leadership uh, to learn with Wanta yesterday. On that note, um, I'd like to bring Wanta Jumper Jumper Patrick uh, here. Um, it's wonderful that we can have you linked up in person. Unfortunately, travel plans fell through with the lockdown in Lajamane. We're glad that you and your family are healthy. Um, for those of you who don't know, Wanta is a Walpuri elder and director of the Milpuri Festival in Lajamane. He's led numerous research projects on Walpuri song, epistemology, education, the repatriation of archival records and youth engagement. Wanta has provided policy advice on Indigenous law, education and youth matters to government and industry bodies, including the Australian government's Indigenous Voice National Co-Design Group. This morning, uh, Wanta would like to share with us an intriguing story about cooking the kangaroo. And if anything, I think this is a brilliant way to open our symposium uh, and touching on themes of responsibility, connection, and being nourished. I think themes that uh, we might all agree cut across our work in many ways. Wanta, wonderful to have you. We're looking forward to what you have to share. Over to you. Yeah, you can hear me? Yep. I'd like to start with just asking everybody, uh, have you seen the movie Tracks? No, no, not anybody? No. It's a, yeah, it's a, it is, it's a true story of a young woman. Well, she's not young anymore. She's old, uh, Robin Davidson. She's better known as the camel lady. And she decided one day she wanted to track across Australia. Australia, just, you know, go and meet the West Coast. Yeah. But then you know, he, he met a, an old fella, old Gilpe, um, an old person. From Manabella. Um, Recording in progress. From Annabella and um, yeah, one of the scene from that movie is um, she wanted to. She found a dead kangaroo, 
All she wanted to do is cut the kangaroo and eat him. Yeah. The, the old fellow wasn't around. But, you know, as soon as he started talking, the old fellow appeared and said, no, no, you can't touch the kangaroo. Yeah. Uh, they had a language difficulty trying to get across, but some Robin uh, knows that she's, um, she understood what he was trying to do to stop her from cutting up the kangaroo. <laughs> I wonder today, if one day I'll ask Robin what she thinks about that. And maybe explain it to her. But anyway, she's a friend of mine. Yeah, I'm supposed to get a, this box of chocolate to her. She lives in Castle Main. And yeah, that box of chocolate didn't reach her. Because I hate him all. <laughs> but you, you could see why that old fellow didn't want Robin to cut off the kangaroo. She's a real old lady now. But women are not allowed to cut the kangaroo. There's this law thing about cooking the kangaroo too. So it's all a man's job. A hunter had to kill the kangaroo, especially in Walbury. In Walbury, kill a kangaroo and give it to um, a kurungulu, a guardian. You know, if I were to kill a kangaroo, I'll clean it up, I'll clean all the, you know, chuck all his stomach out, but I will not cut the intestine. Now, you seal up the hole and just in the right side of the um, kangaroo. And so you use the intestine to close it up again. One thing for sure, especially the uh, really, I'll call it a a uh, dangerous song is um, the urine. Gotta get rid of the urine. The bladder, yeah, yeah just throw it away. But uh, there's another little urine thing. Pile or something, they call it. Your white fella call it pile or something. Uh, it's a little small sack with the urine in. Yeah, and you put it on the four corners of the kangaroo, the dead kangaroo, while you're cleaning it. You know, that's a big ceremony goes around that kangaroo, and only men are allowed to see it. But funny enough, it's a female kangaroo. Yeah. But, you know, if you got a a male can really do the same thing. Now, all that is sacred, of course. And on one of the ordinary ways, if you stuff up doing that, um, I'll go back, sorry. The, this word, the four corners of the kangaroo, means, um, you know, a dog would go up to a pole or a tree or something and give it a squirt. And, and that says that he wants to own that piece of turf. Yeah, but this one, you are maybe the tree. You are maybe, it's all about the kangaroo claiming you again, reclaiming you again. I forgot to mention that yesterday. But women are allowed to do it. So it's the same principle as a dog, what he's doing to a tree. 
or brass. And I always wondered what was that, what, why we're we doing all this. But when I initiated, I soon learned that's all about country. Yeah. Um, I'd like to show you an image. I don't know if you can see it. Um, Nearly, just um, up a little bit. Uh, and across the hill. Yeah. Yeah. That's a mount. And that's a um, hyenas, and that's a stomach. Yeah. But if I turn it around like that, you see the real shape of why that law is. Sorry. If you just hold it back. Yeah, that's good. Thanks, Wanta. Good. Yeah. You can see the shape of something. Yeah. And that practice and different, maybe I could call it a jurisdiction. Those languages will have their own way. But they have the same principle, always cook it during the day, not at night. All people have told me, you're not allowed to cook it at night, but during the day. Men are allowed to do it. They dig a hole a brown oven and it stays till it's ready to get pulled out by a kurungulu, a jungai in in Yoruba language, and then cutting it up and distributing it to different um, members of the family. You know, the old people, the young people, according to their skin name. Yep. Even the skin name. All our body organs and body parts are all got skin name. Um, that's why it's that is why that law is, is there. <laughs> the law of this land or continent you followed. In order you make a mistake, you, you will have to go away till you get it right. In some other language, right? Yeah, it would be tragic. But I, I can't speak for them. I speak because the old fella who's, a, who's remembered and, and owns the ceremony of the kangaroo, yeah, he's now very, very old. I remember sitting down with him. And he told me to talk about this. Yeah. Because in the dream time, the kangaroo was followed up by a sinkhole. Yeah. The male kangaroo just um, could hear the, the female kangaroo down the earth there some, somewhere. You can only hear the thumping. He still hit her heart that she's still alive. And that, it caused him a lot of stress. Till one day, he saw a woyo woyo, a hopping mice. Yeah, he, he managed to catch that mice and pull it. Pull his ears, pull his tail, pull his leg. And eventually, to all the micropods around the region, yeah, that's how it came to be. This is a sacred story, but I only will talk a second. She, um, the old fella, has made a children book out of the Woody Woody story. Yeah.
eventually he got into the big red, the big kangaroo, and I traveled. That is why the cooking of the kangaroo, the, the cutting and preparing all that, they all represent the law of this country. Just can call, you know, some white fellow to shoot, cut it up, skin it. Oh. That's no, no in, in our society. Women are allowed to cook nowadays. Uh, the kangaroo tail was set. Not even a real kangaroo, but it's wallaby and all that. They allowed to cook there and it's bought in the shop. But when you're hunting the real thing, they're prepared to make everyone happy. Because they want to follow you. They want you to be a, a reliable leader. Yeah, just doing that, you know, really proper way will win you some people to look after you. Yeah, that, that's what it's all about. The sky is a emu, the earth is a female kangaroo. Now you can see the real story of the coat of arms. I'll get Sam to sh sum up, put that image up there. Yeah. The star, the morning star. That star is a wise man. Wisdom, sorry. A metal shield in the middle, in the middle of the metal shield is the Southern Cross. That same sort of cross was um, shown to me yesterday in the form of a necklace. Yeah. You know, I could read that. Uh, um, the position of this, that star is um, the, after the wet season. So it's a season thing too. You've got the kangaroo which represents uh, his continent. You've got the emu that represents the sky. All that is in the song line. Song line that is now disappearing sadly. But there's more interest amongst young people. They want to learn this, this way. They wanted to go more hunting. We're trying to tell them not to overshoot kangaroos. One or two is the limit. Yeah, I remember uh, a Chapangati went and wanted to impress his family. He shot six or eight of them. Her mother, She's a kangaroo clan. She started crying and told his son, you shouldn't have done that. Two is a limit, not six or eight. But that's why it's important. Because he's got that wondery daddy story as well. I'll just get the drawing back and show you. If I can find it again. It's somewhere in this book. Somewhere in the east, there's a mouth. Somewhere in the west, there's an anus. Somewhere is a stomach. 
is the mix. Follow. But then again, I can't speak about Dano people's country. But I'm just saying it. Uluru is the stomach or the heart. The Katatuta is another stomach. So knowledge is learned and put in through two of them stomachs, the brain and the stomach is to nourish you with knowledge. Same way as when we eat the food. And that's why cutting it up and giving it the right to people's skin name in a world free society is um it's always been that law. I hope you understand. Once uh, that's given us lots of food for thought for both of our stomachs. Being reclaimed by the country, I, I think this is a really important uh, thing that we can all, all start to think about. And, and I really want to thank you for your um, encouragement for all of us to um, listen and learn to read the country in a new way through songs. Um, and feed on Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> feed on the knowledge of this country. That's it. Aaron, would you like to um, say anything while we've got Wanta here? Wanta, I just wanted to say what a joy it was to hear you talk again and see you on the screen, if not in person. Um, and to thank you for your generosity now and over the years for sharing what you know. I think you're very clearly one of the most important teachers that we have in this country. And your, gener your generosity in teaching us about the law of this continent is, it, it's invaluable. It really is. So thank you very much. And it's, it's so great to see you again. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Wanta. I'd, I'd, I'd like to um, introduce um, some of my good friends now. And we're going to be sharing a little bit about a collaboration between the Australian Art Orchestra and some Yungo musicians from Moko, Daniel and David Wilfred. As they're coming on the screen, um, let me just introduce them. I'd like to introduce, uh, first of all, Peter Knight. Peter Knight is the artistic director of the Australian Art Orchestra. He's a, a trumpeter, a sound artist, a composer. And uh, since he's taken over the reins uh, with the Art Orchestra, he's, he's initiated a whole heap of wonderful collaborations across many cultures. Um, but especially a, a really interesting opportunity for young music graduates to get together with Indigenous musicians um, at, at what is known as the Creative Music Intensive. And that's been a really important, um, I think, initiative in this country for many, I think, uh, seven or eight years now. So there must have been perhaps 150 students go through this and, and had the chance to spend two weeks uh, learning about Manakai and other musical traditions uh, with Daniel and David Wilfred. So, Peter, well, well done on that. Also on the screen, we have um, <laughs> Aviva Endine. Aviva is a clarinetist. Um, she's just uh, finishing up with a, a fellowship. You, you, what was that fellowship that you've just finished up in Sydney, Aviva? It was a, a good achievement. I'm actually still here. I'm at the P. Glenville Hicks house um, in Paddington here. Yeah. Wonderful. And Aviva is a, a musician with the Australian Art Orchestra too. Daniel and David Wilfred have also been uh, musicians uh, engaged with Australian Art Orchestra over 15 years now. Um, they're both ceremonial leaders, Daniel Wagalak and David Ritangu from Nuko in southeast Arnhem Land. Daniel, last uh, two years ago, was the Northern Territory uh, Government uh, Indigenous Artists Fellow. Um, and both of them have travelled widely inter internationally to festivals like the London Jazz Festival. Uh, they've taught at Cambridge University, the Hong Kong Academy of Performing Arts, and uh, recorded many many albums and concerts 
uh, with musicians across this country. So it's really wonderful uh, to have you all here today. I believe uh, Sunny Kim will be joining us shortly. Um, like um, I mentioned, hi, here. oh, she's there. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I'm on the land of, uh, you know, Gurnai Kunai people on, the, on up on Mount Hotham, and it's raining quite heavily here. And so the, <laughs> unfortunately, I'll only be, um, you know, audio today, but I am here. <laughs> Wonderful to have you. Sunny, Sunny is still up at uh, the Creative Music Intensive uh, doing some teaching and rehearsals. Um, she's a, a vocalist, an improviser and a composer, but also um, a lecturer at Melbourne University as well. Well, there's been 15 years of collaboration between Wagalak uh, Singers and the Australian Art Orchestra. And across that time, a guiding narrative that shaped uh, what has happened has been that of Rucky string. We're going to explore a little bit about Rucky today and how it shapes our relationships and the ways we sit together and listen to one another. But just to introduce this and get us warmed up, I'd like to begin with a video that shows some snippets of one of the most recent projects, Hand to Earth. This has been performed at festivals across Australia over the last two or three years, and only a month ago, released an album, which we'll hear about shortly. If we could pop that video up, that would be fantastic. Make me happy, make me feel good when I play the music from the orchestra. Hand to Earth is, is a project that has been years in the making. The Australian Art Orchestra has been travelling to Nooka, to South East Arnhem Land, travelling to Korea, um, building friendships, building associations. We first met David and Daniel about 15 years ago and the, the collaborations that we've made have gone through different phases and um, different incarnations and I feel like Hand to Earth is really synthesising those long associations and, and, and learnings that we've made together. And then when, when we all look together and we sing, and I follow you, you follow me. I start my ditch and you come behind my back, follow me. Songline and the rock can pull two things. It can pull you or it can touch you. You're not singing from your head, you're singing from your heart. Working with Daniel and David has given me so much um, inspiration for new sounds. The process has felt like almost finding my roots and rediscovering the reason why I should sing, that I should continue to sing. My place, and you see, if 
everything a mannequin. A mannequin. And you can see everybody. The rocky pull everybody together and you can see one big family. It's still the same when I come up the stage. It's still the same. I'd like to thank uh, Ruben Lewis for his production of that video too. And I'm always struck by the intimacy of this collaboration. Um, the, the relationships between the participants really come across. So we'd like to explore that, a bit of that now. But Daniel, I wonder if um, you'd like to share with us for a little bit around Rucky. What is Rucky and, and why is it important? Rucky, this is important for us. And we like to share with Rocky and on the song line. When they had a funeral or someone passed away, we have to share that. Mm -hmm. We have to keep that Rocky. Mm -hmm. That's our way to. Mm -hmm. Keep it and to share on the next generation to come and more to learn and give it up at another community at Bukau, Lumua. We can see the string around in the house. We can see the string there when someone passed away. So you do different string. They keep that string up there, not to use the house. Still the house gonna be smoky. That's what string is. And pull everybody there and we share the, their knowledge and what they learn about on the song line, like what they learn about dancing, did you do play? That's what Rocky meant. So if you put the Rocky on the houses, put there and everybody go and celebrate. Everybody start dancing, did you do? Clapping stick or singing. Yeah. Rocky that's is what, no. That's what no. Rocky. He bought two things. He bought one on the house, make everything there, and people come and dance. From other places, yeah. Rocky is also about the Yarata, isn't it? The yeah. connections through the generations. And, and so how do you understand Rocky about and the ways that you sing together? Because you've shared before about the different voices in song and the ways that many different voices come together in one string. Yeah, many, many voices coming in through like different three, three voices so five voices coming in to the one song, but they get different voices because the rock is full of things here and they want to share different voices. There's a, there's a sense of happiness and joy as you gather together with different, different family, different, different country. Yo. Yeah, happy, happy. happy. Yeah. Some driving, yeah. And what's what are those different voices? They've all got different words that they're singing too. And so um, everyone's got different lines. Could you share us a little bit, Daniel, about 
what are the different voices doing when they're singing together? Different voices when they're singing one song. Different, but they're sharing their, they're sharing their, their uh, voices and what they're singing. Well, this is my voice and how I sing. Well, this is what my, I like to share. This is my voice. So I'm sharing with my voice. Maybe this other blog singing, he's sharing his voice, making things together. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Sonny and Peter, um, you've developed a close relationship with David and Daniel over many years now. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how this particular collaboration, Hand to Earth, came about? Um, <laughs> I'm waiting for Sonny and Sonny's waiting for me. <laughs> well, Sonny, do you want to say something? Um, well, this, um, the vision to bring all of us together in one space was really Peter's and on, on continuation of um, AAO's, you know, vision for for a long time. Um, you know, Peter really trusted us to meet continuation. So we, the first time we gathered, it was in um, Tasmania at the Creative Music Intensive, hosted by the uh, um, Australian Art Orchestra. And yeah, we got to meet and we got to hear each other. We got to eat together and hang out, got to know each other. We got to sing and make some, but it took time. So the next year we were invited again and the following year and it, for, and for, for us to really feel like we got to know, um, how we can connect through sound and how we can be together in one space and make something beautiful or say something together. You know, it really um, took a lot of fostering, I think, by Peter. <laughs> and, and I have to also acknowledge that, um, you know, I, I came into the art orchestra uh, around eight years ago or so now, um, and there'd been a lot of incredible work um, by... Um, Art Orchestra members before me, David and Daniel, um, and other um, community in Nooka, and, um, and Paul Grabowski, the founding artistic director of the Australian Art Orchestra's commitment to building relationships and to creating a space for, for collaboration to happen is, um, is, you know, has to be acknowledged as being absolutely crucial to, to this. So, uh, I think David and Daniel would agree, Kangapoo. That's Paul's nickname up there. <laughs> well, there's been um, a, it's a bit like the Rocky. There's been a long uh, history yeah. of, of different voices weaving together, hasn't there? And and what you're doing now is one strand in that. It's it's come out of it's been supported by a lot that's gone before, but it's also quite unique. It is, and and we 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 also we we um, made an incredible journey up up to Barunga Festival and then on to Nuka with Aviva as well um, in two, God, was that 2019? Two, uh, it seems, um, seems like a very short time ago and a very long time ago simultaneously, but that was really important. And things happened there um, that I'll never forget. And one of the things that I always remember is sitting around a table late at night, listening to Aviva and David play bass clarinet and Yadaki. Um, Think I, yeah, it's moments like that that um, uh, space is created for something new somehow. I don't yeah, know if Aviva but, has any memory, memories of that moment. <laughs> yeah, Aviva, I'd like to hear about this because we, we actually have this lined up to play a little bit of this. Oh, great. Um, we're going to do it later, but let's let's do it soon. But uh, you, you, you travelled up to Nuka for the first time whenever it was, 2019, and... and um, 
what was the process there of, of creating with David? Because often uh, in this in this collaboration, they've been sort of set ensembles or things like that. But you've been finding some new new conversations uh, in your travels. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it was such a special trip. Um, and I think just for fact checking, I think it was 2018. <laughs> um, so it's been going a little a little longer. Um, but it was such an amazing amazing journey. We played that festival, and then we were um, you know invited into the community in Nooka. And um, even though it, you know Daniel actually wasn't able to be there with us for quite a lot of the time, uh, he had other work on. Um, and but David and, and Dorian and a, a bunch of other wonderful people really made us feel welcome there and um, we shared a lot of time just sharing meals um, going and sitting near the river and getting to know what it's like to be there um, and yeah there were just some really beautiful spontaneous moments you know after a meal sitting outside I remember particularly one night um yeah, it was, it was this beautiful evening and we just started playing and we didn't talk about what song we would play or um, even a story. Uh, and I feel like there was a sort of spaciousness to our playing on that, that particular evening, which felt like something new. Um, possibly not having an audience there, but also having um, Pete's family and Sonny's family there kind of listening, being part of the conversation. And it was sort of um, a beautiful opportunity to just let those collaborations and those relationships just kind of go somewhere else and just follow follow wherever they took us um, and it felt like a new way of playing where we were really I guess we called it following the music um, and we were just listening to each other and really leaning into each other's sounds and and pushing each other I suppose very gently to to try things we hadn't done before um, I certainly felt like I found new ways of playing, new sounds um, on that, that night and new ways of connecting um, through sound. And uh, yeah, it was a really, really special, a special night that we've been able to kind of then continue those collaborations through Hand to Earth. Um, yeah, particularly playing with David that, that time. I think it was the first time I'd played with David without Daniel. Um, and I guess just that instrumental space, like what, how the instruments connect um, without, the, without the singing voice as well. Um, it enabled us to sort of, I, get, I guess, get into some, some more details of nuances of sound. Yeah, I, I wonder if we might listen to a bit of this now. This is taken from the Hand to Earth album and it'll give you a sense of what Aviva's talking about. And then, and then maybe David, We'll listen to this and, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you were thinking when you were recording with Aviva. No, we're cutting. Thank you. 
Wow, that's uh, it's certainly one of the most beautiful moments I've, I've heard for many years in listening and um, hearing, uh, just tracking this collaboration with the Australian Art Orchestra. David, um, there was no Bilma there, no clapsticks. How does that um, give you more space to be free and improvise and, and follow the music? Just muted, I think. Sorry, guys. Is is Liam there? He's able to unmute. Yeah. Hey, that's good. Thanks. <laughs> there you are, Pipi. <laughs> David, how do you, how does that, um, do you remember working with Aviva and, and what were you thinking when we were playing with her? It was good, good playing my dj with, mixed with the, with Viva, yeah, playing, yeah. We have fun and Viva playing, yeah. And it's really good, yeah. You've been doing different things with your playing, haven't you? You've been mixing it up. Uh, sometimes you talk about remix. Yeah. 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 Remix, yeah. Mix it up. Yeah. Playing the, make the sound, yeah. Yeah. And then we'll walk. I break my deeds and then make noise playing. Yeah. When fever go up, I just make the noise. Yeah. Make the yeah. 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 When you're listening to Aviva play, David, what are you hearing? What do you hear in her music? Yeah. 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 The walking yeah. I was playing walking, but no, no clapping stick. It's only me and Fever. Fever plays second spawn, and I play my ditch. No singing. It's only thinking the song line. Yeah. <laughs> You're hearing the song lines in your head, but you're actually using them in a different way, aren't you? Yeah, different way, yeah. Cool. Daniel, um, we've talked recently um, about this sitting down together, yeah. and, and you've said that you're not trying to build a bridge across cultures. What happens is that as we sit together, who we are comes out of out of our relationship with one another. We're talking about right pity, yeah? Right pity. Sorry, Daniel, we can't hear you either. <laughs> what? What now? You want to listen, yeah. That's it, right. Thanks, Liam. Yes, yeah, then. Yo, it's good. Yo, all right. Right, pretty important for this uh, knowing how to play together. Eh? Yep, to play together and. And the fair and listening. 
while you're listening to the story or from the family or friends. Yeah. You're getting more yeah. knowledge. You're getting more knowledge from the other blog, the other people. Yeah. It's telling you to respect and don't do any no good stuff for bad stuff. You have to respect on that. What you can learn. That's gotta be impossible for right really maybe old men talking to you. You have to take that responsible to the to learn and listen. Like you become a song man or or you doing your job working. And Balanda, white people like to respect the everyday people. So we I give respect to I'm respect to it, but we gather up and playing or making new things, singing or making song. We have to respect the that. Right, Piri, right. It's, it's about listening, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's, also right. about, it's also about talking and, and playing together. Is that right? Yeah. Maybe you're there playing or I'm playing. You have to respect. And respect the sunlight or making things, learning. That's right. And how does Raipuri work with Raki, the string? Because this is the same idea in many ways, isn't it? We're talking about Raki same. and Raipuri. Yeah, same. Yeah. Maybe you're doing with Peter, or then you're doing with Peter, or Beaver. That's going to be after respect. And yeah. can I say something, Sam, about my experience of learning about Rucky from um, Daniel and David um, that I think is relevant to um, the work that we do at CMI is that there's just there's an incredible spirit of generosity and inclu inclusiveness. And um, uh, so when Daniel is teaching us about um, Rucky, it's not like it's something we're learning um, uh, from a distance or some kind of theoretical thing. It's actually something, a process that we're being included in. So it's, it's really an action. Um, and, um, and I think that has, has been really transformative for people who've had the opportunity to come to CMI and other people as well, who've connected with David and Daniel, um, through the art orchestra. It's been a really, transformative process because people feel a part of this action. Um, does that make sense to you, Daniel, that it's a, we're all part of it? We're all, the um, everybody who's there is drawn together by the Raki and um, and we're, it's not a, it's not like learning from a distance, it's being inside. Um, Daniel's still muted. <laughs> <laughs> That's where that clock is happening. Does that make sense to you, Wawa? Yeah, that makes sense with me. <clears throat> and so when you when when um you meet all the um people at CMI, you know, um we become we make a story together, yeah? We're making a story. Mm. You're making your own life and you're making a new story. But we have to keep that old story. That's the main one, that's the old story. But we're making new story. And the new story is connecting with the old story, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's what we're doing. That's a profound thing. From That's been a profound thing for me to experience. I don't know about um, Aviva and Sunny, but um, at least for me, just personally, it's been very profound. 
interesting experience um, with the Two Birds song. Mm. Very much, and um, that's what's happening there, isn't it? I think, Sunny, do you want to tell us a little bit how that um, how that's come about? Because your your song has been woven into Daniel's like this as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so it really came about because of this question that was raised, you know, in uh, in various discussions um, at uh, CMI and um, that was that the question you know was that we, is it is it okay for to to you know to make music with you know our others <laughs> cultural others is it okay to do that <laughs> and it was a little bit at the time you know I I, I felt quite um, shocked by it. <laughs> I, I felt very, very puzzled by it because to me, um, you know, meeting um, our others through, through music, you know, it, it has been such a profound part of why I, I improvise and why I sing, you know. And so I, I wanted to sit with that question with Daniel, <laughs> but I didn't really um, know how to like articulate it. But um, yeah, sitting down and we started actually talking about the earth, you know, and our love for the earth, our love for country, our love for the creatures and people and different um, animals and spirits and, you know, how we needed to really connect with and to perhaps nurture, you know, and give back what we are given. And as we were sort of wrapping up the conversation and, you know, about to go back to everyone else, Danielle said, oh, Sunny, I hear a song. <laughs> Sing along with me. Then and then he sang Guguk song. It was a very beautiful song. I didn't know at the time what it meant, but he he told me in the later what it meant. And and you know, so it it's really a it was um, connecting, you know, with him and finding a common ground, finding coming together and and with my own experiences of how I've come to really fall in love and to respect and um, connect with the earth and how, you know, if through his uh, generational and ancestral memories and through his living, he has really embodied that, like a, the coming together of those um, strings <laughs> that, that gave birth to that song, you know, and... Uh, and then, and as we sing the song, we, we fly, we fly together, we fly over the lands and in the, you know, through the skies, wherever we can go, and we try and bring the people together, we call out to anybody who's willing to hear us, and anyone who wants to be included on the journey, you know, to, to fly with us and send, send out that message, you know, really together. <laughs> That's wonderful. Daniel, this is a story, a Manakai story of two birds mating, isn't it? Yeah, two songs, two birds, sharing together. Like you see people flying from other places. So when you fly together or travel to another place, you travel safe, get there. And you see in different places. And when you go back to your place, that's my home. But when you fly to another place, you see everyone coming in. That's what a bird song means. Travel safe and get to the place and meet people and learning more things and learning the song 
and then we make it more and more. Yeah. That's the wonderful thing about Manakai, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Many different birds and different songs and countries are coming together to the one ground, isn't it? Yeah, that's the one ground. Yeah, that's the one. I'm going to play a little bit of this um, uh, if if you if you like. Um, this is just the end um, of this, and um, this is two birds. Daniel is Guguk, um, the Wagalak bird here. Yo. I'd love to ask uh, you, Peter, about your approach to improvisation and your your string line, the, the things that have fed into your uh, practice, and Aviva and Sunny too, because I think um, there's an important synergy there that that's actually given space and nourished this collaboration in all sorts of ways. But what what sort of influences do you bring to your own playing? Um, well, lots of different influences, but I guess. Um, in um, in that instance, I'm, I'm kind of using a lot of electronics and um, live processing of my sound, and um, I use a lot of um, delays. Um, I've got a particular way of using delays in my sound, and um, and I guess the precedents for that really are my primary influence is John Hassel, who's a great American trumpet player and composer who um, passed away recently. Um, but um, I'm not sure if that's exactly what your question, if that's exactly an answer to your question. Um, in terms of my approach to the music, um, I think it's just to try to actually listen and create a space. Um, and, and I think working with musicians like David and Daniel, where listening is the primary practice um has been very powerful influence on me and and i believe on the other musicians who've been part of this journey as well um listening and being present and yeah trying to create a space is that kind of getting to what you're asking sam yeah yeah there, there's also a sense to um that what you're doing, you're listening, but you're also nourishing like the space, create create a space, like you said. But 
Mm. You're also trying to trying to um, do things that might um, generate all sorts of images and conversations. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I believe in the idea that we're having a creative conversation. You know, so I and one thing, one of the things that I've always really loved about working with um, David and Daniel is that um, we share a curiosity as musicians, you know, um, Daniel's always been really curious about what it is that I do. And I think that he's always fed off, um, the sounds that he hears me making. Um, and that actually, you know, um, gives me space that he, Daniel also creates a space for me. Um, and, and he demonstrates his interest in what I'm doing by, asking me about what it is that I'm doing and talking to me about the sounds that I'm making and, and contributing to my thoughts about my role in the, on, in the ensemble. So it's really, I feel like, I feel like that's something um, that is just about us in us being two musicians working together, you know, and that's actually not uh, so much about um, our cultural the, the differences in our in our cultural backgrounds is actually just we share something and that is that we're both curious about sound and music and i think you know david's the same i've had some amazing experiences playing with david we did a incredible gig um a couple of years ago at the make it up club in melbourne with an, a drummer um sum we were from sri lanka and was like full-on improv hardcore improv do you remember that one david and I said to David, when we went to that gig, I said, what are we going to do? And he said, we follow the music. And I was like, yeah, great. Okay. It's kind of permission, you know, it's permission to um, explore together. So, um, and we, we, as improvisers, like Dan, David said, you know, um, sometimes he follows the orchestra and sometimes the orchestra follows him. We weave around one another, but there's, um, that generosity of creating space for one another is really, is really exciting and crucial. I think it's it's the two birds sitting in a tree and just talking to each other and singing together. And uh, Daniel, uh, you, when David, when you're listening to Peter, what are you what are you thinking about? You're both creating something new, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. making some make some speech music listening the bird to bird singing and then of my speech. I, I think this comes back to right pity because these guys are also sitting listening to respect you but also to hear the voices that are coming through your own practice and your own history that comes to your music um hey aviva uh, you've thought a lot about improvisation and why improvisation is important for relationships and um, interaction what's your take on all of this Thanks, Sam. Yeah, I was just thinking as I was listening to that kind of what the, I suppose, something that we all share, all five of us and, and the art orchestra more broadly is, I guess, kind of an interest in, in sounds and like where sounds can take us. And I think, you know, in some way or another, we will <coughs> perhaps identify with them thinking about our sound as like having an experimental quality um like this of when I'm playing with hand to earth when I'm playing with each of these musicians like they're letting me find new ways of finding new sounds in my playing um and offering them to each other and that might inspire a different story um or a different song like I remember this beautiful moment actually when we were in Canberra and we hadn't seen each other for a really long time and um Peter and I started playing and I was experimenting with this new tube that I'd found and seeing, seeing what kinds of sounds I could get out of it. And, um, you know, after a few minutes, Daniel just came in with this new song that I'd never heard before. And it was so beautiful. And it was kind of like out of that 
that searching and kind of connection, you know, we kind of, we inspire each other to go to new places. And I think that that's something that's really wonderful about being improvisers that we don't always have a fixed idea of where we're going, but we're kind of bringing with us, um, you know, everything, everything that we've done before, but everything that, you know, all, all through history, everyone has brought with them, um, you know, from their practices with their instrument, but also, you know, whether you want to say it's Western art music or jazz or whatever it is, it's kind of like all, all in there. And I think that that's something I started thinking about when um, Daniel first taught me about this concept of, of Raki. Um, I really felt that. I really felt like we were just, you know, part of this lineage and we're, we're bringing with us the tools that we might have learned through different traditions. Um, but where, like, it's our responsibility to kind of keep you know, uh, winding that and keep keep exploring where it can go so that it kind of has a future um, that's always going to be connected to that past. And I certainly feel like that, like with my, my personal practice, um, instrumental practice, there's, you know, there's, a, of course, the importance of, sort of having learnt the tradition and understanding what's been done with that, that instrument before. And maybe that's what you're talking about with inspiration, um, you know, cultural inspirations that we each bring with us. But then kind of just pushing it that little bit, just kind of going, where else can this go? And how is that going to connect in new ways with, with each other? And and that song that we that we kind of discovered together or that we that came into being together in Canberra, that that ended up um being recorded for the, the record. And it's the first it's Nungri Nungri, right? Wawa? Well, well? Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. How come, Daniel? How come that song came came out from those sounds? Do you remember that moment? Mm. This came from this for me when I was walking, walking and listening <clears throat> many many stuff. But um, something comes in the somewhere, <clears throat> and that's what no one remembers. Pointing with their eyes, it's come up for no. Mm. There's all sorts of new things that come out of when I, I think when you take the metaphor of, of voice or string lines, suddenly you're out of this um, essentialist thing that this is jazz and this is Manakai and we're trying to figure out how these things fit together. Yeah. And it becomes a conversation that's horizontal and you're actually exploring things together on that we've got a really interesting question from one of the audience members and you'll someone's asking that um does it help because it doesn't help to have a musical conversation to play together when everybody's instrument involves breath is there something important about uh, breath and playing together yeah, can I maybe um, have a first go at that? Yeah, yeah. sure, Sunny. <laughs> That's Sunny. Yeah. I yeah, I think it has a lot, a lot of. It may, I think it's a really good metaphor for what we do together. You know, the the breathing out and breathing in, the giving and receiving, the listening and sounding out. Yeah, it's it and and how we relate through the breath, the act of breathing together, in and out. I think it it it, it is a really great metaphor for what we do in the you know in the space of um, making music together. What do you think about that, David? Daniel, you how are you thinking about the breath and and playing together? Yes. 
Daniel, have you got any thoughts? No, all good. <laughs> yeah. All, all good. Look, we're going to have to finish up in, in one minute, but just here's an interesting question that someone puts to us. Um, you're thinking about music differently. Obviously, um, we've been talking about the ways that you're thinking about music, you're thinking about collaborating, voice. Is the word music even too restrictive for what you're doing? Yep. It's ceremony in many ways, isn't it? It's it's yeah, relationships. Yeah. Many, many songwriters, many yeah. people singing, singing and talking. And one song there, another song there. We can see that song. One song from and the war, one song from good island. Yeah. Some from Adamblen. Yeah. Some song come from Adamblen. Can you look up there? Yeah. 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 That's wonderful, David. Anyone else want to add anything final there on that interesting question? Yes. Um, about about music and whether the word music is too restrictive. Yeah. Um, I don't think it is actually. <laughs> I think the word music can encompass mm. a lot. Um, but that is a that is actually a very big question. I bet Aviva's got something kind of uh, cooking away there. <laughs> I, was just, I, mean, I think it's a really wonderful question. Yeah. Um, but I like, yeah, I think I'm kind of, I feel similarly to Pete in that I think music is everything already. And it always is, but I mean, certainly in this conversation that we're having together, it's, mm. it's more than the sounds that we make together. It's mm. about you know, you know, I've got new family now, and um, so much new knowledge, and you know, the connections, like the sharing of ideas, the sharing of food and time and space, and the sounds that we make together what we might call the music is is sort of one part of that relationship i suppose that's the thing that we share through a recording or through a concert um but it's it's got much deeper roots than that and 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 it needs those um, to sustain the music yeah that's wonderful and it's it's not not as if we're saying that um everything's music in some sort of mystical wishy-washy sense that it's hard to know what it means but this stuff is really tangible it's about people families country it can't be separated from those those tangible things either and so maybe the the right question is um not so much is it more than music but how does music like you said peter actually encompass all this as well relationships and, and connection and country and, and I, I like to think of trying to expand people's notion of what music is and can be as well. Um, and, and in my own practice, I do think a bit about at times I'm kind of trying to create a musical gesture and at times what I'm doing with sound is not actually creating a musical gesture. But in the context of Hand to Earth and the work that we do together, it feels very much like music to me anyway, just in my own kind of, you know, uh, wall of thoughts that are constantly going on. <laughs> Sunny's going to say something. I, I want to hear what Sunny has to say if we have time. Yeah, Sunny. Oh, oh, Sunny. <laughs> I guess it really depends on how, you know, how everyone defines music, but um, I feel like, you know, I mean, everyone's already said everything I think I, I, I can offer, but I think it's really about relating, you know, and the power of sounds to relay, like um, for, for power or the capacity of uh, that is inherent in, in 
sounds that that that, that, that connects us you know, and tapping into that and playing playing it with it <laughs> and 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 having our um, relations be uh, expressed in, in you know and, and embodied in sounds you know so I think I mean if 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 you call that music then I'm I'm in it I'm, in it. <laughs> I'm doing yeah I think that's uh, yeah <laughs> that's great have well, we run out of time you. Sam we're have out we of time yeah and and I yeah. want to thank you all for um, uh, this conversation I, I want to thank you too for involving me in this conversation over over many years it's, it's always a delight to to hear from you and, and to listen to your music we had one final question who wants to know if there's an album there is indeed and I'll post a link to that uh, shortly but uh, look thank you once again uh, Daniel and David thanks for joining in from Darwin good to see you um, and I look forward to the next time we, we get to chat and, and listen to one another. So thanks. Thank you for creating this space, Sam. Yeah, thank you. No thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We're going to move on to our next panel now. And I'd like to introduce uh, Brian Garawicha. Uh, Brian is a, a ceremonial leader from the Birkali Gupapoingu clan. He's a musician in the early Arnhem Land popular band, Soft Sands, and his visual art is displayed in the Australian National Maritime Museum. Brian has long been engaged in culture, language and heritage research and holds a Master of Indigenous Knowledges from Charles Darwin University. Brian's going to be joined today by uh, Professor Aaron Korn, who uh, Many of you know, Professor Aaron Korn is inaugural director of the Indigenous Knowledge Institute at the University of Melbourne and has served for a long time as director of the National Recording Project for Indigenous Performance in Australia. Uh, they'll also be joined by Dr. Anthea Skinner, uh, who's recently been awarded a McKenzie Fellow at the University of Melbourne and Anthea is a musicologist, archivist, and is working to develop adaptive music technologies and pedagogies for students with a disability. Um, we also have some contributions from Marcia Langton, who was unable to join us uh, today, um, but has uh, provided some video. Uh, Marcia is a Redmond Barry Disking Distinguished Professor and Foundation Chair of Australian Indigenous Studies at the University of Melbourne, and also has a long-term association with Yungwu people and the work of the National Recording Project for Indigenous Performance in Australia. So over to you guys. Thanks, Sam. Mori, Mark up Midi, Namadine. You're on mute. <laughs> Unmute, please. <laughs> Can we get Brian unmuted, please? Fantastic. Namadi ni mori. Main mak kato. Main mak, main mak. Main mak mitri. Very good. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Good. You look very relaxed. Thank you, <laughs> as always. <laughs> okay. I had a covered chair. Couch. Well, look, um, this is a discussion that uh, started at the Indigenous Knowledge Institute's um, <laughs> first symposium this is here, which was for the International Day of the World's Indigenous Peoples. And we're continuing a discussion that happened there because every time we talk about this topic, we really only have time to look at a tiny, tiny sliver of what Brian and Renell, his wife, know. Um, and, you know, I feel that this is a conversation that like all such conversations in this group will go for a very long time. So thank you for joining us, Maureen. Thanks for introducing us, Sam. And thank you, sure. Anthea. Um, we have a slideshow, which I hope we can mix with some talking heads. So I'll try and get that up in share. Uh, and so please let me know if we're seeing this. 
because I can't really see both at once. Yep, I can see that. Um, so Brian is here on screen. Um, Ranel is there in the background and is a contributor to this ongoing project. Um, it's important to say that Marcia's work with Yongu exchanges in Northeast Arnhem Land with um, Southeast Asian traders from Makassar and elsewhere extends from 1996. She's been working on this project from 1996 onwards and provides a lot of the foundation for our work in this space. And um, one of the videos that we're going to play from the Gama Festival 2005, it's also important to mention, was um, an outcome of a project that we did with uh, Brian when I worked with Alan Marrett at the University of Sydney and we uh, found some internal funding to bring Macassan musicians and dancers to the Gama Festival that year, where Yongle uh, collaborated with them in performances and then afterwards at the Darwin Festival. We have Anthea Skinner, who is um, a very important scholar in um, a number of intersecting fields, but in this capacity uh, is speaking from the basis of her knowledge of the Malay world and I've introduced myself previously. So on we go. Oh, Renel, Nandi, Namari. So just to locate everybody, we're talking about the Yongle cultural block, which is the pink shaded area in the Northeast of Arnhem land. It's massive and expansive. There are at least 60 clans, depending on how you define a clan and clan groupings in that part of the country. And a lot of the song and dance traditions for a lot of clans, um, you know, are still really only known about by their traditional owners. Um, I'm very fortunate because mm. through my long work with uh, the Global Pongo Clan Alliance, uh, which Brian is a senior leader from, since the mid um, 1990s, mm. I've, I've had a very long engagement with um, Global Pongo music and dance and culture and law and other such things. But today we decided through conversation about these sessions that we'd talk about a very specific place, a very important place for the Birkali clan within the Gukupongo Alliance. And that is the Wangangaraka, the, um, the root homeland, the foundation homeland called Lunkucha. And Lunkucha yeah. is a tiny island, <coughs> uh, two tiny islands, uh, in the west of Arnhem Bay and the adjacent peninsula on the mainland. And that is Lumpucha. Yeah. I can remember when you told me back in 2005 that I had to hire a charter plane and we had to go up and take these photos. Mm -hmm. It's the first time anybody had ever asked me to hire a plane for anything. Mm. And I'm really glad you did it. So there's deep Dawu, there's deep narratives about Lungkucha. And again, we will only scratch the surface today. Um, every time we talk, we take a tiny slice and talk about it in great depth. So today by no stretch of the imagination is the whole story. It's just a tiny window into it. Now, we didn't really have time to rehearse this because of the vagaries of Zoom connectivities. Do you want to read that, Maury, or shall I read it and you respond? Maury is the water that surrounds the Pumapil and Bidikamira homeland of the western coast of Arnhem Bay. As the tide comes in, more of creates life and all the Kupapumabirkili holds. Now, if we could have the audio clip that's labelled Brian 1, please, we should hear the right song to start us for Munguru, the waters that give life to Lungkucha. Mm -hmm.
जोर जोर मजे वाल मंगरो I was just, um, I thought there was a, <clears throat> that was the Hindi film, huh? mm. uh, I thought the next one was supposed to be Yoto film. Mm. Yeah. We, we have those recordings, but limited time. <laughs> yo, yo, that's right. the, these were recordings that um, Brian directed and sung as lead singer and then I produced back in 2005, and we went to not just Lungkutja, but significant uh, Gukupango sites to record them. I think, oh, you're on mute, you're on mute, sorry. I don't, don't know how you got onto mute again. I might read this one just while Brian's on mute. So Gunbil is well, the, yeah. yeah. Do you want to read that one? Go for it. Gunbil is uh, the um, class you see when Um, we're muted again. Yeah, we're muted again. Aaron, I'm not Aaron, sure read it out. Happening. Um, I'll, I'll read it out. So, yeah. Gumbelka is the calm, glassy sea when the whole of Mungaru is calm and it's used as a lullaby. It cradles newborn babies of Gugupongo mothers. 
Um, in fact, there's a dance move that is like cradling a baby. Yeah. Yeah. And Gunbilk is a representation of the peace and harmony that's possible between all people when everything is calm. And that's related to something that Brian told me on the beach at Nikawul, um many years ago, that when Munguru is calm and glassy, that allows the coral spores from beneath the water's surface to be released into the air. And it makes people drowsy as they sit on the shore and it sends babies to sleep. As, as well as uh, Noe, when, uh, when, when, um, the, when uh, someone just passed away, yeah? becomes a deceased, yeah? uh, he rests in peace. And, mm. and you rest in peace. Uh, so it has a funeral connotation as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And when the sea is calm like that in that state, um, Berkeley hunters get in their leaper leaper, their canoes, and paddle out to search for the turtle Mararaka, which is Malarka, which is a uh, I think a species of loggerhead turtle. Oh. Return with the tail to shore, and and you you told me something about the other night that you can literally see the turtles on the resting on the bottom through yeah, the calm really. glassy sea. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you can literally look out across the horizon, and the sea is so much like glass that you can see the turtles resting on the bottom. Yeah, that and get them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. That's a painting of the do you, your daughter. Oh, uh, who's who's this? Uh, Edwina, my daughter, who did a painting of Malarka, um, surrounded in that while the two uh, now we rainbow serpents are there and they're resting around the the. The two two rainbow serpents. Mm. Yeah. 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 And they're the they're the diamond shaped turtle. Mm. Yeah. Malarka. Did you want to say something about the shape of the turtle shell? Yeah, they like they like uh, to us we call them like a fifty cents or a treasure. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So it's uh, that's our treasure, Birkiru. And they actually have great value, those shells, because um, through trade up into Asia, they became very important trade items. They were actually valuable um, as trade items as well. But we'll get to that later. Mm. Mm. But that's a beautiful painting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. And, uh, Around there's a no one uh, opening the 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 triangle the 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 one opening the the horizon no uh, uh, the parallel the like uh, um, sit, sitting on the, the horizon. Yeah, cl clouds on the horizon. Yeah, yeah. triangles on the outside representing the the Gapala or the one open the cloud. Open the cloud. Yeah. So associated with this place is Jadi Jadi, a blue flag that, when it strikes the ground and is embedded into the earth, is used to mark Lumpucha as a Google Point or Berkeley homeland. Yeah. And that's why everything we're doing here today is blue. Mm -hmm. And that's often why whenever we appear in public together, we're wearing blue, if you ever wonder. <clears throat> yeah. And when that happens, 
when the flag is planted into the ground, the Berkeley stand firm, which is a song we're about to play. And they call out sacred names that declare their eternal ancestry in Lung Yeah. Mm. They call out the names of Munguru, the water. They call out the names of Malaraka, the turtle. They call out the names of the turtle's breath that creates the Wangalpilini cloud formation. Yeah. It can also appear in a big anvil shape, like two arms outstretched. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So there's a song next. So now's a good time to say something, or do you want to hear the song and say something after the song? Um, I'd say all, all those uh, the you read is according to the manikai. Everything uh, acor uh, according to the the song and the chorus mm. uh, are all. Uh, contain it in that ceremony yeah that is incorrect that is correct because um the text we're using is actually from a show that we um directed at brian's end and produced at my end uh i think for the darwin festival in 2005 yeah and and um a lot of the text you're seeing is a script from that which follows a small portion of the Manakei, the public ceremonial song series that Brian knows. Again, it's a very small fragment of a much bigger series. And Brian knows multiple series for multiple places uh, and actually knows multiple series and multiple different song genres as well. So again, a tiny fragment. No. So this would be the audio titled Brian 2. And this is the Lichondara, the standing yeah. firm, standing strong as the flag is planted into the ground. I think we need Brian unmuted again, please. Oh no. Please. Okay. 
Jo, um, <clears throat> das som oss um, um, Rikon standing firm and also claiming and declaring <coughs> declaring <coughs> the um, the ground declaring uh, with the uh, uh, Dalkara that is uh, as you heard the other part was songs and the other, other person was calling out names and declaring the names of the the pole itself and the people that, that is standing firm and <coughs> owning the ground like when you stand and sort of you put your foot inside now the the sand inside now you you rub rub with your foot and declaring it and stamping at the same time ah yeah. and and the the flag you see there is <coughs> uh bamboo <clears throat> bamboo uh the flag yeah. Mm. Yeah. Bam bamboo is a song subject too isn't it because yeah bamboo bolo. yeah bolo, it floats it yeah. floats yeah. Mm. Mm. and birkeluja uh flag is already always a bolo mm. no flag yeah. and also if you look at the dancers designs on so, the, no. on their chest they're the same triangle uh, the cloud well, horizon yeah, cloud horizon yeah. flag and those two lines again mm, two they, they, that they, we're meeting before you know, they um like the snake and the, uh what do you call uh 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 when they the lightning the lightning yeah. the lightning from the rainbow snake from the yeah, from the rainbow snake yeah. mm. so all of this is leading up to the blue flag doesn't just mark the ownership and the belongingness of gupapanga berkeley to lunkaja it also proclaims that place as a port yeah. and the willingness the intent of the Berkeley to trade with foreign visitors from across the seas to the north mm -hmm. of the Australian coastline yeah. and that brings in a whole different area of conversation which in our last panel discussion together back in August we did explore with you Maury at great length but this time around we wanted to bring in a different perspective from somebody who knows about the Malay world mm. and things and sea trade and that person is Anthea Skinner but it is indeed sung and remembered and known that Berkeley and other Yungle clans met with Macassan visitors from 1750s onwards mm. until the early 20th century mm. uh, who sailed from Sulawesi on the beach mm. at Lumpucha mm. uh, and there was trading uh for local rights to collect sea cucumber tree pang beshtamer tarepa um which is all different names for the same thing sea slug mm. uh from local yungle waters in return for all the imported goods that mccassons brought like tobacco rice alcohol cloth metals things like knives playing cards and a lot of other goods so yeah. did you want to talk about that before we move forward and introduce the video and Anthea? I think you just covered. Ma. Ma, okay. Yeah, because yeah. I'm also keeping in mind that we're on a timeline as well and we're yes. really over time. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if we could now play the video, please. This is Brian and other younger people, including some you might recognize, like Wittiana Marika, dancing to welcome 
Macassan visitors from an ensemble called Takping Siwalia that um, Alan Merritt and I were able to fund out of the University of Sydney to bring to the Gama Festival that year. Mm. So let's see. If we can... day wasn't it uh, it was <laughs> it was really good and it was really good uh, yeah but i can't do that dance anymore no we're all shockingly older than we were then yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. all right let's keep let's keep going because I, yeah. i'm not even looking at the time i'm relying on sam to tell us when we have little time yeah. left but let's just keep going and yeah. to get through it Mm -hmm. So, Anthea, over to you. You let me know when you want the next slide. And sure. So, so again, you can watch our previous video and see Maury Brian talking about these slides. But this is Anthea's take on it from a Malay world perspective. <sighs> no. Okay. Yep. And and um, I, I guess I wanted to start by saying that while I am ethnically Malay, I am not from Makassar. Um, that's not my area. But um, my grandfather who um, was a scholar of classical Malay, which was the lingua franca in the region, um, wrote the English translation for one of the first uh, Macassan court texts to be written in um, written in classical Malay. So that's where my interest started. Um, so I guess the first thing I want to talk about is who are we talking about when we say Macassans? Uh, and you can see it's like labelled there at the bottom of South Sulawesi there. Um, but it's important to note that Ma Makassar is a, a Malay word, not a Makassan word. Um, and so it's a word we use to describe speakers of the Makassarese language group who live in that area. Um, but the people we're talking about would have thought of themselves as residents of the twin kingdoms of Goa and Talop, uh, with Goa being the larger of the two kingdoms. Um, they were considered locally as one people with two leaders. Uh, Goa was the larger of the two. Um, kingdoms, and so much of the trade was auspiced by them. Um, but I guess one of the things I really wanted to talk about today was why uh, the Macassans went all of that way. You can see it's 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 a, not a, a long, uh, sorry, not a short trip. 
and you can see from the sort of arrows of the trade winds that actually sort of says you have to it takes a year to go there because of the way the trade winds work you have to stay for six months once you're there because you can't get back so this is not an easy journey to make by any means um, and as a result um, trepang fishing was not a traditional um, trade item uh, of the Macassans. They were originally spice traders and they um, dominated the whole spice trade in the region, which as we know, um, trading through Malacca and into Europe was worth a fortune. When the Dutch arrived in the mid 17th century, um, they basically, after a long series of wars with the Macassans, the Macassans were very strong and powerful. They fought hard. Um, the Dutch eventually took over the spice trade and uh, that left the Macassans essentially looking for new places and people to trade with. So what did they do? They turned north. They looked to China and that, you know, they could no longer go to Malacca and Batavia because the Dutch were sort of controlling that. So they looked north to China and they, instead of trading spices, they traded um, bird's nests and shark fin, which they got mostly from the coast of Borneo and trepang, which they also got from Borneo and from Australia. So that's really um, how the Macassans ended up there. So that's why we start to see them arriving um, in large numbers um, in the sort of late 17th century. Here's what they're arriving in. Um, these are their prowls. And I guess one of the things I kind of wanted to point out here is this is a lovely picture and it's, a, you know, there's two little boats here. This is not how they would have arrived. It was not two boats. It was a massive fleet, um, possibly hundreds of boats with thousands of people who, because of the trade winds, arrived and stayed for six months. So there's, a, a you know, a really big logistical issue about having that many people arrive on your shore. Um, and, and the Macassans, you know, historically were very powerful. So, for example, when the people on the island of Bima decided uh, in the early 1600s to uh, break their vassal state relationship with Macassar and trade instead with the Dutch, the Macassans descended on their port with 400 war vessels. That's a big fleet, you know. Um, and so I guess I just kind of wanted to point out that th this was mass production on a mass scale, especially at the time. This was not a few little fishermen arriving on the coast. This was, this was a lot of people. Should and we move a, on to the next slide? And a massive, yeah, and a massive cultural impact, for, as we'll see, on the exactly. other peoples of the North Coast. And I think when Matthew Flinders encountered a fleet, I forget the date, 18-something, late okay. 18 it was 60 boats and 1,000 uh, crew. That, that's the size of it. But anyway, moving on. So even today, you know, that many people arriving suddenly on the shores of Arnhem Land, it's, it's, you know, that would be a massive deal. You know, it's, it's huge. Here is um, a very attractive um, photo of the trepang, which is what they were um, harvesting. And I guess the main thing I wanted to point out about, about this is that this is not a product that Macassans actually used. As we said, this was a Chinese product. They were only really um, farming it or harvesting it to supply the Chinese for Chinese medicine. So this was not, not a local delicacy by any means. Next one. Okay, so this is a list of a lot of the kind of words that have been sort of loan words from various languages in the Malay world. We have- um, The Yungle languages, yeah. This is in Yungle language, so- um, the musicians in the room might be familiar with um, <clears throat> in the sort of second dot point juling, suling, it would be in Indonesian, flute. Um, so some of those are, you know, current Indonesian or at that point Malay words. Um, we also have Makassaris and Bugis words, the Bugis being the other people who lived nearby in South Sulawesi. The one that really interests me though there is Lipa, the canoe. Um, because that, I think, points towards an even earlier um, phase of contact. That's a Samabaja word, and I think it's also used by some of the other sea people around Borneo. Um, <clears throat> so to me, that looks, I, I suspect that that would probably pre actually predate Macassan contact. There's, you know, Macassans mm. weren't the first to arrive, which mm. isn't surprising given the numbers they arrived in, you know, it's... Mm. And, and Nganachi, which is, which is a Yungle world word used for alcohol today, is, is a Yungleization of Iraq. 
which again is well known throughout the Malay world mm. as a um, rice wine. Mm. And uh, Dumburu drum. Drum, yep, yep. Oh, and of course, the younger money, the w- younger word for money is <laughs> rupiah. Yeah. <laughs> rupiah, yeah, yeah. And the younger word for non yungal for white people generically. Oh, balanda. Balanda, which is the Malay word for Dutch. Hmm. Or a Hollander. Hollander, yes, exactly. Yeah. That's where it comes from. <laughs> Hollander. Yeah, that's what it was originally. So it's English, Hollander, mm-hmm. Malay, Indonesian, Balanda, and then Yungal, Balanda. And there's another there's another very important loan word that we discussed at great length about discussing, um, which is this one, Anthea. Walata Walata, yeah. So Macassans um, that arrived, they, they, they were Islamic, uh, part of a, a wide range um, group of Islamic states in Malaysia. And on their ships, they had imams. Every ship had an imam uh, who would lead the call to prayer, which would have been heard from the beach. Um, but also the imams were not just there as religious leaders, they were also there as sort of... Um, lawyers peacekeepers i guess uh when, when there were disputes they would they would they would come in and, and and make sure people were treated equally and fairly so if individuals in the fleet transgressed against local law um which in a fleet that size is probably bound to happen at some point it would have been the imams probably who would have come in and helped to negotiate how to deal with that so the imams would have been an important part in, but not just in the religious activities on the ship, but also in the negotiating with um, people on the land and people whose waters they were in. Mm. Did you want to say more about that, Brian? Yes, you're, you're right there. Um, uh, they were uh, like, uh, like, like peacekeepers, uh, landlords, and they look after our nature as well, make sure nobody uh, does harm to the to the land or to break branches or dig hole or or to like man made thing, you know? No, like yeah. Mm. They mm-hmm. have to be look after and be p- peaceful to the and harmony to the land, holy holy land. No? Mm-hmm. So yeah, like Walata Walata and Urate Laku, my ancestor, same as like Walata Walata, uh, look look after my area. If I do wrong thing, I get punished. Or I get told mm. by uh, my old people. Uh, these are the laws of this. or You can't do this and that. You can do this, but you can't do that. You, know? you, you can you, you can get a fish, just a little bit of fish, but you you. Uh, after that, you don't throw the bones. Uh, 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 like, uh, you have to make a hole, mm. hole one hole, to contain them there. So, so that next time you come for that hunting, uh, you you still get more feed by the land and sea. Yeah, <laughs> these are the laws for Olata Olata and Olata Laku. You don't uh, eat, uh, do the get a lot of fish and then and then throw bones everywhere. You no, know? no, you can't. Our custom is to con- contain in one hole. We we'll keep it even for even for doa 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 moyote and for irija moyote. They have the same sort of a uh, common. Uh, protocols 
all low, you know. Yeah. I just thought I just, uh, you yeah. know. So something, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so something's just occurred to me that I should have worked out years ago. Yeah. So the imams on these vessels were the important intermediaries who went to the young leaders and said, well, we actually do have law and we will respect your law and we will be the go-betweens to make sure that, you know, we can actually get along. Yes. Okay. I should have worked that out years ago. I apologize. <laughs> um, and of course, with, with about 150 years of continuous contact, Jung will certainly knew that these so-called Macassan visitors had a God and a set of laws that they themselves recognized, which comes across linguistically into Jung or Mata as well at the well at Very interesting. Thank you. Sh shall we keep going? There are yes. a few more slides left. <laughs> yes. Anthea, you, w again, we've explained this at length previously, but your, your take on this Anthea. On the flag system, look, I, I don't have a, a massive amount to say, except that um, mm. Macassans used flags in very similar ways, both uh, ceremonially and also as this um, marker for ports so that people coming in in ships could easily see where they were and weren't allowed to go. So there was a sort of a regional flag language, I guess, that sailors understood. Mm. Mm. And you were telling me last night that flags are as sacred in that world in in their world yes as, like potentially more sacred in their world than they are to you know in the younger world they're at least of equal sacredness and they're, they're considered to be very sacred and there are specific flags that are you know representative of the king not not just like you draw the flag but the actual physical mm. flag you yeah. know not you can't make a copy of it it's it's the king's flag yeah, yeah. Uh, th things like that Mm. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, they're very sacred. Yeah, yeah. But without going through it in detail, because we have a previous video about that, these are the flag colours that were used to mark the ports of um, Yiddish and Wordy Yongle clans, where Macassans were allowed to land and trade, and they were established ports, and the regular visitors in those Macassan fleets knew where they were and knew where they were meant to go. Um, <coughs> You'll notice that the bottom one actually isn't a Yungle clan. It's a group of um, Austronesian whalers known to the Yungle, it's an exonym, as the Woimul or the Bapa Yili, who visited the Yungle way, 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 way back. And we're not even sure how long back that was. But the general story is that they were like the Yungle um, and therefore adopted into the flag system. Um, but that's something you probably do explore at greater length down the track and probably deserves its own video. Um, this brings you back in, Maury. Mm -hmm. So there were places where the Macassan commercial fishermen were meant to go and they were marked by flag flags. And then there were places that they weren't meant to go. No. Yeah. So what happened when they went to places, particularly at Lunkutja, where they, when they went where they weren't meant to go? Um, um, uh, the Lunkutja was uh, forbidden. For the forbidden. island. The, the island. island was forbidden. Mm. So it's only, uh, only Uratelapu, the Mokui, or a lady looks after the Navi. Mm -hmm. But when, if you remember that we ported at Yalakun, which is the other side, the west the main, coast. Uh, other side, uh, mainland, mm -hmm. uh, a place called Yalakun, that's where the flag was ported. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that represented the Lungutja. Mm. Yeah. So these two snakes in this painting by Brian, uh, which is um, in the National Maritime Museum collection. Are Mundukul. The two Mundukul. Are the, yeah, Mundukul. 
wonderful mm. water python, very mm. sacred for Berkeley and Google Channel. Mm. These are also the two sandbars. There are two sandbars that exist between the island and the mainland peninsula, mm. and it's completely prohibited. You just cannot go there. It's mm. too sacred. Mm. Um, and there was a Macassan vessel captained by a, a captain called um, Baba Jambang, or Father Tamarind, if you like. And mm. when he put his anchor there, mm. when he tried to get it out, the whole, whole, yeah, whole pro went down the, yeah, but the medical had it all, yeah, no, and and ate uh, ate all the passenger, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and yeah, one one of them was the the lady, and. After when he, when he, when the, one of the medical eight the lady woman <clears throat> and it uh, spread it out to the Longoja beach and <clears throat> there's a, he he he's he turned it into a, a, a psycho Psycho pi no and those tree the psycho palm palm tree you you grow on the beach which is which is uh, suspicious mm. uh, you, you we don't usually have not to grow in the beach mm. but that was specifically grown there because the the monocle sped it and and uh, the the palm just shoot out and became a psycho palm tree in the beach usually it's uh grow in the bush but th that special tree is in the on the sand on the soft sand but on the beach, bro. Mm -hmm. you know, if we would have had time to go there, we would have you would have taken the photo of the the cycle you no know, palm tree grow in the beach. Mm. You know. mm. I think that we don't have time to explore Wura Titi or Wura Mukoi further today. But mm. I think that next time we talk in a panel, we could mm. explore her more, if you like, mm. because she in herself has a lot of fascinating stories that extend and flesh out this story yeah. and change further in ways we don't have time for today. But to summarize, they anchored in the wrong place, this Macassan boat. They couldn't put their, pull their anchor up. The rocks kept it. And then Mundukul, the rainbow serpent, water python, rears up out of the water as a storm, I'm imagining, and then eats the whole boat. And the only soul that is saved from that process is the one of the, of the young girl on the boat who becomes an important Kupupongo Birkali ancestral figure, Wura Titi. Mm. Mm. Mm who's related to the cycad palms that um, Brian mentioned, which are very, very sacred mm -hmm. and normally would grow in forest groves. They would normally never grow on a beach side as, as Brian said. So it's unusual that they would be there. No, it's unusual. Mm. Uh, we're coming close to our time. Okay. Um, we have a closing song. Oh, fantastic. Okay. One closing song. So if you could play audio three, please. Brian specifically requested that we play out with this to close the ceremony. <clears throat> Thank you.
Thank you, Brian, Aaron, Anthea, and Ronell. It's been a stimulating uh, discussion to listen in on. Um, that brings us to the close of this morning's session. Uh, for those of you joining from the University of Divinity, this also brings us to the close of our two days of symposium. But you're more than welcome to join us for the remainder of the conference. Uh, I'm posting a link here. We're going to be kicking off again at 2.30 after lunch with a panel and some papers under the title, Listening to the Ancestors, How Indigenous Traditions of Song and Dance Can Inform Our Responses to Current Ecological Challenges. So thanks again to all our panelists, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Buttercup.